Merci Antoine, merci pour l'invitation. Euh, donc, euh, en fait, j'ai... Euh, Oups, là, ça, ça parti. Et, ah, donc, je n'étais pas trop sûre de quel type d'audience on avait, donc euh, j'ai préparé mon talk en anglais, déjà. Et ça sera aussi pour Iman. Et, et je ne fais plus d'engaging, à vrai dire, Antoine, ça sera plutôt sur l'optogénétique. Mais donc... Euh, comme Antoine l'a dit, donc je travaille à l'Institut de la Vision. On est arrivé ici en 2018. Avant, on était au Saint-Père. Et euh, je vous présente, avant de commencer la présentation, je vous présente déjà l'équipe. Donc, on s'appelle Microscopie en Modulation de Front d'Onde. OK, now I will switch into English. So, the, the team is an interdisciplinary team. So we are uh, uh, physicists, engineers, but also biologists and uh, biophysicists. So Iman, who is going to, to take the, the, the second part of this lecture, she's actually a biologist. And we have those, those multiple disciplines in the same team because we uh, have a dual interest from one side to, to develop uh, advanced optical methods to investigate neuronal circuits and on the other side to use this approach to uh, to really have our own uh, question in the lab and we since we moved the division institute we are specifically focused on uh, the development of method for what we say all optical manipulation of visual circles okay because again i was not um, very sure about the kind of audience so i will have a, a first introduct introductory part where we go through the different definition that we will need to understand really what we do in the lab. So, um, so all optical manipulation of neural circuits is the, the main focus of the lab. And so uh, let's start, first of all, by defining what is a neural circuit. So in a very uh, <clears throat> general way, we can define this as a, a, a population of neurons interconnected by synapses that uh, are in charge of controlling a specific uh, function. And uh, to, uh, there is a, a large uh, field in neuroscience today, which focuses on understanding how the circuits work. And uh, for that, we need to be able to uh, follow how the, 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 the elements of a circuit uh, communicate, and, uh, and then eventually to, uh, to be able to manipulate the, the way those elements communicate, so to see how this manipulation can or not uh, affect a specific behavior. So one of the main uh, way, uh, the main signal that neurons use to communicate is the what we call an action potential. So this is a, a very specific uh, electrical signal that is exchanged uh, when neurons communicate and uh, uh, it, either in a form of a single spike or in a form of trains of spike with specific spike frequency. So if we want to understand how an, a circuits work, we, have to be, we need to be able to record these kind of signals and also to evoke, manipulate, or modify the propagation of those signals. So for here, this, uh, uh, this uh, manipulation was done with the use of electrodes. So, uh, and we can distinguish in a very general way between uh, extracellular electrodes. So uh, that enables to manipulate and record the activity of multiple uh, cells at the same time. And so they can reach a very large population, uh, population of neurons, but they lack cellular resolution and specificity. And obviously, because it's electrostimulation, they're also invasive. Um, we can be more precise by using uh, uh, intracellular uh, electrodes so that we can precisely uh, control and record the, the, the signal from a single cell, even a single cellular process. But uh, obviously, this is a, this kind of approach is a low throughput in the sense that we can probably manipulate and record the two, three, four, uh, eight. I think was the maximum neurons at the same time, but we cannot control large population of cells. <clears throat> and again, because they need a, a physical contact with the tissue, they are considered to be invasive approach. So uh, in the past uh, decades, uh, researchers has try to find a way to replace the use of electrodes with light with the idea of being less invasive and also, as we will see, to be prob probably more flexible. And so we come uh, in uh, what we call today all optical investigation of neural circuits so that the, really the dream experiment will be to be able to replace the electrodes both 
for uh, reading, the, so to record those electrical signals, but also to manipulate those electrical signals. And this is what today is referred as reading and writing uh, neuronal circuits. So uh, from reading, uh, this is mostly done today uh, with the use of genetically encoded calcium or voltage indicators. And these are fluorescent protein. And uh, I will go into to quickly uh, uh, show uh, how uh, calcium indicator works. And in the part uh, presented with Iman, uh, we will, uh, she will mainly focus on the use of voltage indicators. And then for writing, uh, the solution came with, with optogenetics. So I will give you a very quick overview of what we can do reading uh, uh, calcium indicators. And most of this, this presentation will be on the use of light for optogenetics. And then you will learn more uh, in, uh, for, on voltage indicator in the second uh, uh, part of this, uh, this presentation from Iman. OK, so how can we read uh, an electrical signal? Uh, uh, sorry, before, so before before that, uh, you will hear uh, all along this lecture that we speak about genetically encoded uh, indicators and also genetically encoded proteins for optogenetics. So very quickly, what does what mean genetically encoded means that we can uh, perform what we call a genetic targeting. So the trick is to build up a, a genetic sequence where there is the gen the gene which code for a specific fluorescent protein bound with a promoter uh, that is specific of a certain cell type. Then this uh, uh, genetic sequence is inserted in a, in a, in a virus, and uh, uh, which is then used to, uh, through uh, injection, typically, to, in, to infect a certain brain region. And at that point, only the neuron that can recognize the promoter, which is in the, in the uh, genetic sequence, will be able to produce the fluorescent protein. And so this enables to, given a certain uh, brain region, to select which kind of cell type is going to be uh, sensitive to light. And we will see how this is, 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 uh, is extremely important both for reading and for writing. So starting from the reading part, so uh, we need to be able to use light to record an action potential. OK, so the very first uh, challenge to be solved is to uh, be able to convert an electrical signal into a fluorescent signal so that this can be detected with an optical microscope. And the solution came from what I was saying before, the so-called genetic and encoded calcium indicators. So these are uh, fluorescence proteins that uh, uh, becomes brighter when they bound to calcium. And something that to be clarified is that each time there is an action potential, so one of these electrical spikes propagating through a neuron. This also goes with the opening of specific calcium selective channel that led the entrance of calcium into the uh, intracellular space. And so because those proteins, when they bound to calcium becomes brighter, by, uh, by following the evolution of the fluorescence, uh, we can uh, um, image the propagation of those electrical signals. So this is an example of one of the very first uh, uh, movie that has been done uh, demonstrating how those, those indicator works. So you will see here in red, uh, this is the ele electrical recording. So each time you see a spike, this is exactly the time where the cell is uh, producing an action potential. And then in yellow, you will see the corresponding fluorescent traits, uh, which very nicely uh, reproduce the, uh, the, the electrical uh, the electric acti activity. So we really have a very powerful way to convert in light uh, the, uh, the um, electrical signaling. So um, now the, the, the important challenge at a certain point came when uh, we wanted to record, the people wanted to record this kind of signal uh, having single cell resolution in, uh, from neurons uh, which are uh, embedded in a scattering tissue as is the brain. And so this required to be able to uh, focus the extension light deep into scattering tissue. And the solution for that came with the use of two photon excitation, which I guess most of the people in this audience knows. But very quickly, uh, the, the principle of two photon excitation has been predicted many years ago by Maria Gopempire, who was predicting that, that an atom or a fluorophore molecule uh, can be uh, excited by the absorption of a single photon, giving rise, for example, to the emission of, of a fluorescent signal but can also equally be excited by the quasi-simultaneous absorption of two photons, having roughly the half of the energy and uh, producing the same kind of emission. 
So in, uh, in, in microscopy, the, the interest to photon absorption came uh, by, for two reasons. First, that because we use a lower energy, we can use a, a longer wavelength. And because the penetration of light in scattering tissue is uh, uh, related to the inverse of the, 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 the wavelength, so that the more we go into the infrared, the more we can penetrate. And the second uh, interest of two photon absorption in microscopy is that because we need this uh, quasi simultaneous of two photons, this gives rise to the two photon absorption, uh, to a dependence of the two photon absorption on the uh, square of the excitation density. And therefore, as we can see here, if you focalize a single photon beam down to a small spot, uh, still all the uh, molecules, atoms, or, or cells uh, illuminated during the path are going to be excited. A while into photon microscopy, eventually only uh, the, the targets that are exactly at the focal plane will receive enough photon density to be excited into photon. And so we have a very nice way to reject the out of focus light. And so what we say into photon excitation, we have an intrinsic axial confinement. And so at this point, it's possible to build up a microscope where you have this, 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 this focalized to photon volume. And then you can scan this spot in a, in a specific re, uh, uh, region of interest. And so you can record what we say, an image which has uh, uh, the cell resolution because has this uh, nice uh, optical confinement. And now is in, in the same preparation, you, uh, you are managed to express those calcium indicators so that you can repeat this, this scanning approach. And then you can follow the fluorescent signal in time and you will uh, be able to record, as is shown in this, in this example here, this is a recording in vivo from the mouse visual cortex where there have been different uh, visual stimulation projected to the animal. And you see that we can nicely see that different neurons are becoming brighter at different times, showing that, there is a, uh, that the circuit is responding to, to visual stimulation. So then uh, uh, there have been a, a number of approaches that has been combined to this classical to photo scanning microscopy to go deeper and deeper. So we can already uh, gain a lot by uh, applying adaptive optics. So people can now reach uh, uh, five to 700 micrometer. And then we can go even, uh, even more in depth uh, going into three photo microscopy. Or if you really want to reach even deeper region, we can combine, it's possible to combine two photo microscopy with microendoscopy. So to have access to brain region, which are several millimeters in depth. It's also possible to increase the field of view uh, with respect to classical uh, two photon scanning microscopy, for example, building up what we call today some mesoscope where there are multiple scanning head that enable, this is a, a spectacular movie from the Casbo Boda lab, where you see it is now possible to record the entire visual cortex from a mouse and then to, uh, to zoom in at the region of interest. So to analyze the propagation of signal at single cell resolution. Okay, so this was a very quick overview just to, to, to come to this conclusion that today on the reading side, by using advanced optical method that used to photon, to photon or trifodon excitation and uh, calcium indicator is possible to resolve a neuronal activity from thousands of cells with a, a cellular resolution. And so this enabled to start really to see what is happening uh, uh, during the functioning of different circuits in different brain area and the second step when, uh, uh, came when people start to say, okay, now that we can so precisely see what happens in a circuit, uh, can we also start to manipulate what we see to see if any special temporal change on the activity pattern was also affecting the, the, the observed response that can be a behavior, can be the activation of another neuronal circuit. And uh, so the next step was to be able to find uh, approach that enabled to use light to modify, modify the activity of a certain circuits. And uh, in this case, the, uh, the challenge was then to making neuronal activity sensitive to light. And the solution came from uh, what we call today optogenetics, which is a, uh, an approach which is really transforming the way we uh, do uh, research in neuroscience today. So uh, at this point, uh, the, the key elements that are used are called the microbial opsin, which are also genetically encoded in neurons. So we can define which cell type is going to express a specific microbial opsin. And then depending on the, on the protein that you, you choose, it is possible either to 
activate or inhibit neuron activity depending on which kind of, uh, of, uh, of ions will flow through the cellular, uh, to the neuronal membrane. And so it is possible to, uh, to uh, for example, by precisely uh, act acti uh, uh, activating a, a neuronal cells to produce a, an action potential or even a train of action potential that we can uh, uh, modify in, in, uh, in the spiking frequency or to inhibit uh, propagating signal as is shown in this, uh, in this example here. Again, uh, this is a genetically targeting, so it's possible to choose specifically which kind of cells uh, will respond to light. And just to give you an idea why this is extremely important, uh, you can have a, a look at this, uh, this exemplary. Uh, this is one of the very first uh, movies that has been recorded showing uh, uh, the, the use of channeled opsin, one of the first opsin that has been used in optogenetics, where this opsin has been uh, genetically targeted in the, um, in the motor cortex. And then uh, what you will see now is that there is an optical fiber that you, you can hardly see in the, in the film, but it, it is possible to bring light down to the motor cortex and then to activate only this population of neuron responsible to, to start the cascade of event that induced the movement in this case toward the left because it was uh, the light was reaching the right part of the motor cortex. So this is just to say that uh, we are we are really on the way today with optogenetics to start to to be able to control with light uh, specific uh, behaviors. So the 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 one of the, the the first and most important application of optogenetics has been to. Uh, use this approach to what we say to map uh, brain, brain functioning with cell type specificity. So this is something that started many years ago with the, with the study from Wilde Pamphy that among the first start to say, uh, to try to map how different brain regions can control dif different behaviors. So in this specific case, he was interested into the uh, sensory cortex. And so the experiment was to to uh, stimulate with electrophysiology different uh, human brain region and see the effect produced by this stimulation. And with this, he, he could draw what we call the, the sensory homunculus. So really a sort of map on how different brain region uh, affect different uh, kind of perception. So this kind of, uh, this kind of experiment were done with electrophysiology. So they were highly invasive and also uh, they only enable to associate a specific brain region to a specific response, but still were uh, missing the information on which cell type is responsible to what we observe. And which is something that today is possible to do with optogenetics, where we can replace electrostimulation with light. And so, in, in, uh, as in the, in the example of the movie I was showing you before, it's possible to flash light, and now with this by uh, activating specific cell type uh, have a sort of mapping of brain function with cell type specificity. So as you can imagine, this is really an approach that is transforming uh, neuro, uh, research in neuroscience. And thanks to this approach, it has been possible now to start re to identify, for example, neurons involved in memory, in fear, in addiction, in depression, and, and so on. So Despite the, the, the importance of this approach, uh, there is a, a sort of limitation when we really want to start to understand how our neural circuits works. And this came from the fact that uh, if we send light on a large brain region, uh, all the, 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 the neurons that are expressing a specific option will synchronously respond to light stimulation, so they will be synchronously activated or inhibited. And now if you go back to uh, another, this is another example where it's similar to bef before. So, so here we're looking at the visual cortex of a mouse with in response to different visual stimulation. And you will see that although those neurons are uh, genetically identical uh, neurons, they actually uh, are not firing synchronously, synchronously, but actually if you look at the activity of the circuits in physiological condition, you will see that they have each of these, these elements, uh, these neuron contribute to the to the activity of the, the circuits with a very with a very specific special temporal signature and so if we uh, also something that is known here this is an example but there are many other brain region and cell population that they have the same behavior uh, this is individual cortex uh, again what is known is that given a population of uh, genetically identical neuron uh, for example individual cortex if you project grids with a different orientation 
uh, each orientation will evoke a pattern in a specific subcellular population. So at certain point, the, uh, the, the neuron in a specific circuits become specific for a certain, uh, in this case, orientation of the grids. And so if we really want to start to understand our circuits work, uh, there are multiple questions that we might want to ask. So for example, uh, how a specific special temporal pattern that can see is important to control a certain behavior or it can, can I slightly change the space or time of where the, where the signal are evoked and see an effect in the behavior. Other uh, larger class of question that people start to ask today is, okay, which is the mechanism that define a functional group? Is the way those cells are connected among them or is the way as the cells are connected with another brain region? And also are all the elements in a circuit uh, having the same role? Or there are uh, neurons that have a more key role in respect to, uh, to another one. And so this is also a story that many years ago, ago uh, starting to ask, which is the functional uh, unit of the regulating brain function? Is the single neuron or is rather what we call cell assemblies or a group of neurons that uh, control the synchronicity of large tissue, of larger circuits? So if you want to start to, to ask to this kind of a question, we need uh, somehow to replace these uh, whole region optogenetics with uh, what we termed uh, years ago circuits optogenetics, uh, meaning with this a combination of approaches that enable to uh, control a single of multiple targets independently in space and time. And so in, in, the, in the following part of this lecture, I will show you uh, which are the different uh, approach that needs to be combined to, to get the precision of circuits optogenetics which specifically will require to the capability to uh, to deliver light in depth with uh, the precision to, to activate on, only one silicon target or a specific uh, subgroup of cells. And so we say single multi-target excitation of cellular resolution. Then with the idea of controlling large circuit, we, we might want to, to deliver light in 3D. And if we really want to enter in a situation where we can precisely reproduce what the circuit is doing, we, we need to combine this, this uh, uh, optogenetics manipulation with, uh, with uh, a brain uh, reading. And so specifically with uh, also approach for fast reading as you would see in the, in the talk of Iman. Okay, so staying on the optogenetics part, the first part is how do we get single and multi-target excitation at cellular resolution? So uh, exactly as it was for, for imaging, uh, the idea is to replace uh, single photon non-focused light with two photon uh, uh, focused excitation. And unfortunately, with respect to imaging with the optogenetic, this was uh, of particular challenge. And there are two main reasons is that if you, uh, if you use a conventional two photon scanning microscope, having this small uh, two photon excitation volume, what happens in optogenetics is that in most of the case, this volume is too small to open enough channel to evoke an action potential or to keep uh, a neuron uh, inhibited. And the second point is also that in conventional scanning microscopy, if you want to control the activity of multiple cells, you need to move from one target, from one target to another sequentially. So uh, it's very difficult to control the activity of multiple cells within a millisecond temporal scale. And so the use of two-photon excitation for optogenetics requires to uh, find solution that enable at the same time to increase the volume, uh, the extension volume, so to open more challenge at the same time, and also to be able to multiplex light at multiple targets, so to reach them within a millisecond temporal scale. So um, in, uh, in our lab, we, uh, we propose two main approach to solve those issue, uh, the computer generated holography and general, generalized phase contrast method. So, um, very quickly, uh, both, in both cases, we use a key device, which are called li liquid crystal special light modulator that enable to modify how the beam propagate uh, in the sample plane and uh, how the beam propagates and so how the light is focused uh, uh, in the sample plane. Uh, in computer generated holography, this liquid crystal matrix is a, in a plane, we saw the Fourier plane with respect to the sample plane and uh, is addressed with what we call, we, we call the phase hologram. So this is a, 
um, something which is calculated and actually is, is nothing more than the interferogram that the light back propagating from a certain image template will create with our reference beam. And so then when the light is going through this phase hologram is actually in principle able to recreate with light any image template. Uh, in general, I the contrast method, the, the principle is slightly different. It's actually the main mechanism at the base of phase uh, uh, contrast microscopy. So now the special lay modulator is conjugate with the sample plane and uh, the light pattern is, uh, is generated through an interferogram. So in this case, the phase profile is much easier because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence about, uh, between the intensity profile we want to generate and the phase modulation that we impose to the incoming beam. So uh, we will see mostly in the, in the second part of the talk from Iman uh, why we use one approach or another, but in general for now, the only message important to keep in mind is that we do have approach that enable to very precise light, uh, shape light in the sample plane. And the question was, okay, can we perform this light shaping with enough precision to really target only one neurons or a specific population of cells? And so this required, first of all, to find a way to, 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 this, to have this image template. So what we propose is to start with a, starting with a fluorescence picture. So you acquire a fluorescence picture, then on the base of that, you decide which is the population of cells that you would like to activate, or even just this could be a certain population of cells, can only be just a part of a cell. And then on the base of that, you define either your, the, your face mask, either in holography or using generalized face contrast method. And you see that in both cases, you can reproduce a laser pattern that very well reproduce the, the target that you have chosen on the base of the fluorescence picture. You can also use both approach in a much simpler way to simply produce disc of different size or a multiple diffraction limited point that we will see at a certain point later on. Okay, so with both approach, we can very precise shape light. And uh, uh, because uh, the, the face mask are sent on a dynamic device, it's also possible to uh, generate a sequence of activity pattern. And that also you will see later on is, is very important when investigating uh, neuronal circuits. So um, now, because in, in all cases, we want to increase the uh, excitation volume to optimize optogenetics. As you know, in microscopy, each time that we increase the spot size, we lose axial resolution. And this is uh, exactly what you can visualize here for an holographic pattern producing multiple targets, or even for the generalized and contrast method. You see that we have a, a completely loss of axial resolution. And this can be uh, compensated by combining those approach with the, the approach of temporal focusing that is schematized here. So in this case, the key element is a dispersive grading. And what the grading does is to disperse the different color of the pulse through slightly different angles. And so the corresponding difference in the optical path introduced by this dispersion will induce a progressive broadening of the pulse. So now if the grading is conjugated with the sample plane, we will have a short pulse at the sample plane, while we will have the pulse becoming broader and broader and moving out of the focal plane. And so because the two photon absorption depends inversely on the pulse duration, we will have an enhancement of the absorption at the sample plane and we can nicely remove the out of focus absorption. And this you can see in, the, in this same axial propagation now in presence of temporal focusing that indeed this enabled to get a, a very nice confinement of the absorption only around the focal plane. Okay, so this, as far as it's concerned, the, the light shaping approach. So we, by combining this approach with temporal focusing, it's really possible to generate an illumination shape that only illuminates the target or the targets we are interested in. And then we could show that combined with, uh, with different opsin uh, is possible then to very precise evoke action potential and also to, to generate action potential trains up to 100 Hertz and more in a very precise way. And then when uh, this is, uh, uh, approach is combined with what, what today are called the soma targeted opsin, so a virus that enable the expression of the proteins only in the soma, it's possible to reach a real single cell resolution, as you can see in this, in this uh, example, these are recording uh, uh, again from the visual cortex of mouse in vivo. And you see here, we are sending three holographic spot on these three targets, which are expressing an opsin, but also a calcium indicator. So we can follow 
the activation of the cell and you see that the three of them nicely respond to light simulation. And then you can choose to activate just one of them and only that, that cell will respond. So uh, just to, to show that we are really on the way to control uh, the activation of a circuits with uh, cellular resolution. Okay, so uh, before showing you a few other technical implementation, I want just to quickly uh, show you a few examples where this precision was of key importance. So the first is a, is a collaboration we had with a group of Rosa Cossart in Marseille. So here, the interest of the lab is to demonstrate what I was mentioning quickly at the beginning, if uh, uh, we can really prove the presence of those cell assembly or hub cell in, uh, uh, in developing brain. And so this is uh, something that the group of Rosa demonstrated here. So we're using electrophysiology where they could really show that in developing brain, there are uh, cells or group of cells that have a major role in controlling the synchronicity of the entire network. And the question was, can we visualize this in vivo? And so the experiment is just in one slide. So I have to really make a very long story short, but the experiment consisted in doing a first part in performing calcium imaging. So now, now you know this is a way to visualize how signal propagates in a network. And you see this is characterized by a very high frequency activity. These are developing brain. And so on the base of the, of the, the, the calcium image, they could uh, analyze the correlation that each, the activity of his, each cell has with, with the other. And so in this way, find, uh, they found that there are highly connected cells here indicated with the, with the big dot and there are lower connect, connected cells. So the theory is that those highly connectivity cells has a major role in controlling the synchronicity of the entire circuit. So the way to test this was to express in those cells also an opsin and to see whether by changing the activity of just one cell, uh, could produce a, a macroscopic effect in the entire circuits. And uh, this is what you will see now. So this is the calcium imaging. At a certain point, you will see that there is an holographic spot which is placed on this cell. And at this point, you see already by eyes that, that the entire activity is, 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 uh, is, is, is going down. And this also you can visualize here from the analysis showing the inter event interval that when we alter the activity of just one cell is much longer than what was before. And then when you stop the photosimulation of the cell, the activity of the network starts to be uh, the same that was uh, before uh, the perturbation. So this was really the very first proof in vivo that the, uh, the uh, perturbing the activity of just one of those hub cells indeed have effect in the activity of the entire microcircuits. Uh, there is another uh, class of experiment where uh, single cell resolution is of key importance, and this is to understand the, the wire di diagram of a network. So uh, this is something which is very important to understand how a uh, network works. And uh, so the, the, the point is to, to try to understand how cells in a network are connected, for example, to understand whether a functional uh, cells that are functionally homogeneous are more connected than the other. And so traditionally, this was done by using electrophysiology to record the activity from a, a chosen cell that we call postsynaptic cells, while stimulating a certain number of possible, what we call presynaptic cells. And when there was a response, means the two cells were connected. So this experiment was, was extremely powerful. And this is the way we, we know uh, mostly of what is uh, today known in understanding connectivity, but still, uh, is, a, is an approach which is very precise, but as you can imagine, it has a low throughput because it required double patch. And so it was possible to probe four to 12 connection per experiment, and this is an approach mostly used in vitro. So today the, the, there is a big gain uh, in this kind of experiment when you use optogenetics at least to replace the stimulation of the presynaptic cells, because now you can still record for the postsynaptic cell while moving your illumination spot around the, the, the surrounding volume. And uh, just to give you a few number today, doing this approach, we, uh, it is possible to probe more than 100 connections per experiment. So an, an incredible uh, gain. And also because we use light, we don't need double patch, it's possible to use this approach also in vivo. I won't have time to go through the, 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 the to show you the examples, but you can, you can look at those references to, to see uh, example where this approach is, is really giving important, important information on cell connectivity. 
So uh, another requirement that I was mentioning before, if you want to activate multiple cells or if you want to control a large circuit, require to not only be able to control a single or a small group of cells with light, but eventually also to control multiple cells <clears throat> that are distributed in a three-dimensional volume. So this required to further modify the system so that uh, this is, uh, there are multiple ways of doing that here. I'm schematizing the last one we are, we have developed. So these uh, use two special lay modulator. So the first one, as I was describing before, is just producing an holographic sh shape on the grating for temporal focusing. So it's going to be temporally focused. And then you can use a second special lay modulator that alone will produce a distribution of point uh, in 2D or in 3D, which are centered at the target that you would like to activate. And then when the two devices are working together, this second device enables to multiplex in 3D all what the first device is uh, producing on the grating for temporal focusing. And so with this, it's possible to, as you see here, for example, to create 50 temporary focus spots in 3D in a relatively large volume. And to, to say that there are multiple ways of reaching the same goal, you can replace the SLM with a fixed face mask so to, to avoid to use two special lay modulator. You can also replace this part with the generalized phase contrast method or to use just an expanded Gaussian beam. This is what is called 3D shot or to go for more complex phase amplitude uh, approach. And uh, okay, for, for, for a lack of time, I won't have time to compare all of them, but you can refer to this reference where these different approach are compared, but in general, the message is that with, with those approach, it is possible today to control hundreds of, of, of cells in a millimeter cubic volume. And so this is really open the way to control a large volume. And till now there have been a, a multiple application of this approach. So uh, there have been a, a very important paper that has been published in the past year, where this 2D or 3D multi-target uh, uh, holographic pattern has been used to probe what they say the threshold for perception. So very briefly, the idea here is to use Katsum imaging to find which population of cells is responsible for respond when uh, the, the mouse is uh, subjected to a certain visual or factory stimulation, and then to remove the, the stimulation and uh, uh, activate those cells using holography and see whether the mice are, are able to perceive the same kind of, uh, of response. And this actually it was the case. So this is really another way to start to show that uh, we can really reproduce the, uh, the, the perception using uh, um, optogenetics. There is another application that I would like to quickly show you uh, that takes the advantage from the fact that we can generate light in 3D. And this is the fact that we can actually, in this way, decouple the imaging from the photostimulation plane. So there are situations where you don't want necessarily to read and write from the same plane but you might want to act write activation in a certain plane and see how this propagates in an actually distinct plane. And uh, specifically, we use this, this uh, trick to investigate the signal propagation into the retina. This is a collaboration with Serge Picot here at the Vision Institute. So they were interested in understanding how the activity of a specific cell layer, which are the uh, rod bipolar cell, propagate up to the ganglion cell layer. So for those who are not expert in retina, a very schematized in a very schematized way, so light is uh, uh, is captured by the photoreceptor that transforms this uh, optical signal into an electrical signal that then is processed through different cellular layer till arriving the ganglion cell layer where the final signal is then sent to to the brain to to create the real uh, perception of vision. So in this case, it was important to be able to read them right into different into different plane. So for that, we take advantage of three-dimensional holography because we, we perform a conventional to photo scanning imaging in the ganglion cell layer and while projecting holographic pattern up into the rod bipolar cell, which are separated of about 70, 100 micrometer. And so what we could do is what is shown here, we could project different activity pattern while uh, looking at the uh, effect evoked uh, into the, in uh, the ganglion cell layer. Again, uh, is a very long story that is just summarized in two slides, but the, 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 the general result was to prove that actually these, uh, if you choose a specific ganglion cell layer, there, there, are, there is a very reduced region 
in the ambiporal cell layer where the activation of our cells can produce a response, showing that uh, in this specific circuit, the propagation of, of the signal is relatively vertical. And this has implication into the understanding how the propagation of signal works in, uh, uh, in view of uh, the developing of therapy for visual restoration. So uh, I'm uh, coming to the end before to conclude, I just want to show this very last uh, application that will also enable to introduce the next talk. So uh, the question was, uh, at, at this point was, okay, we can uh, very precisely control uh, the activity of, of a neuron in space and time. But now if we want to activate multiple target in a sequential way, how fast we can go. And then the limiting factor is the refresh rate of the special light modulator and also the cell illumination time. And so uh, this, this uh, sequential patterning was limited to uh, uh, a temporary resolution of uh, 3 to 20 milliseconds or even more. And so to, to speed up uh, sequential light patterning, we recently developed this approach that is very similar to the system I, I showed you before. But the difference is that now we have a galvanometric mirror in the, in the setup and also that the special light modulator responsible for this multipoint uh, light multiplexing is uh, instead of being addressed with just one single hologram, is addressed with uh, a number of holograms vertically aligned so that the galvanometric mirror enable to move the temporary focus line across these multiple holograms with a temporary solution, which is now only limited by the galvanometric uh, scanning speed. And so we can generate sequential light patterning with a, a 50, 90 microsecond temporary resolution. And so these uh, has multiple implications with respect to the number of cells we can reach with respect to the local heating. But most important is also a way to, to, to start to design a sort of dream experiment that will consist in record the activity of a certain circuits and being able uh, almost online to reproduce the, exactly the same activity and then to start to slightly desynchronize or modify the special location of activity and see how this uh, small change can or not affect a specific behavior. So from the photo simulation point of view, we are now able to have the, the necessary temporary resolution, but at this point, we also need to have uh, the temporary resolution to record the uh, uh, neuronal activity with single spice precision and millisecond temporary resolution. And so this also require, require to work on the reading side. And you will see that the way to do this is to go for uh, fast uh, to photon voltage imaging, which is the topic of the next talk. So uh, the conclusion of this talk is that we do have a, a number of approaches that can be today combined together for reading and write the neuronal circuit. And I show you a few examples where this is key to, for example, prove the presence of hub cells in controlling circuit dynamic, in performing high throughput connectivity mapping, or to follow signal propagation across multiple layers and probe threshold for perception. So I will uh, thank again the people of my lab that contributed in the different experiment I did and uh, I showed, and then the, the different collaborators, the financing source, and I will be happy now to answer to, to your question. <laughs>